Amen. Hey, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21 today. So, uh, so here at Crossroads Church, we just pick a book and we just go through the book. We don't just choose it. We feel like God leads us in that selection process. And uh, so what we do is we just kind of start at the beginning and we work all the way through. Sometimes that's section by section. Um, you guys aren't going to believe this, right? But in my plan, and it may not happen because the Holy Spirit may change that, but in my plans is to go through an entire chapter in one service, and that just does not happen. That's coming up, so, so you stay tuned for that. We'll see how, if that actually works out. But sometimes it's section by section. Sometimes it's verse by verse. Sometimes it's word by word. And so we just kind of break it up uh, however we feel like the Holy Spirit's leading us to do, and we feel like this gives us an in-depth view of the Bible. It kind of shapes our worldview so that we see the world through the scriptures. And so that's, that's what we want to do. We're in Matthew chapter 21. We've been uh, going through the book of Matthew up to this point in scripture, just to kind of get us all on the same page. Uh, Jesus has been ministering on earth with his disciples for what we believe is about three years. And he's, he's already raised people from the dead. He's already performed miracles. He's already walked on the water. He's already uh, taught. He did the Sermon on the Mount early in Matthew. He's been teaching people. And to this point in his ministry, there are literally Thousands of people that follow him around listening to his teaching. And so uh, Jesus is preparing for the, the feast of Passover where thousands of additional people that normally live in Jerusalem would come to Jerusalem for the festivities. And, uh, and he, he's, he's gearing up for that. And so he's already in Jerusalem, which he rode to Jerusalem on a donkey. They hailed him as the coming king. They laid their clothes in the road for him. They waved palm branches for him. They sang songs of Hosanna over him, hailing him as the coming king. He enters Jerusalem, leads these thousands of people to the temple, and immediately starts disrupting things. He starts turning over the tables of the money changers, the benches of the people that were selling the doves and the animals that you would use for sacrifice. He drives people out of the church, which is an odd church growth tactic. They don't teach you that in any church growth seminars. Just show up, start throwing things and pushing people out the doors. That does not usually work, but that's the route that Jesus went, and he's Jesus, so he can pull stuff like that off. He begins this uh, this this exchange with the leaders of the temple and then he leaves for the day and then he comes back the next morning and so this is where we're picking up so so what we see is part of this overarching conversation that Jesus is having where he begins with the chief priest and the elders and it's not always this way in the new testament but in this instance when it says the elders that's the Sanhedrin which includes the Pharisees and the Sadducees so they're kind of the the governing bodies think of them like the house of representatives and the senate for the temple then you have the chief priests, so the priests would be like the, uh, the executive branch, like the president, so you, the chief priest would be like the president, and you have all of his people, so these are the people, the priests, the elders, the, these are the people that, that run the temple, and the temple was what ran Israel. And so Jesus is interacting with the chief priests and the elders. He's got them all together. And then he's going to talk specifically to the Pharisees. And then he's going to talk specifically to the Sadducees. And then the Pharisees are going to take another crack at it. So he's going to talk to the Pharisees again. And then what we're going to see is that no one else does anything. They just get mad and try to kill him. So this is where we're going. So he's, he's right in the middle of this larger conversation with the leadership of the temple. And, and the, the larger conversation, the theme of that larger conversation is Jesus is letting them know that the way religion is done is about to change. So far, up to this point in history, then what would happen is, is you would have to come to the temple. It was the only place of worship. You would come to the temple. There were priests. There were Levites. You would have to see a priest. If you had a, a legal question about, hey, you know, the law says this, but I do, I do this, and what do you think about that? Then you have to go find a Pharisee who was a teacher of the law, and, then, and sometimes the Sadducees would counteract and say, no, 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 they're telling you wrong. It's not that way. It's this way. And so, so this was the, the order of the day. You couldn't just... I don't know, talk to God and have God talk to you. You had to have intermediaries, you had to have priests, there was a whole thing. And what Jesus is introducing to everyone here is the kingdom of God is about to change forever and for the better. And the way the kingdom of God was going to change was that through his death and resurrection, he was granting us as his followers free access to God. 
So we don't have to have the priests and the Levites and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If I want to know something from God, I can just simply ask God, and God can talk to me. And so what, what Jesus was establishing was that this conversational relationship with God would be the norm for his followers. And to this point, that was not the norm. So you look back at the Old Testament heroes of faith, and what made them a hero of faith was that when they talked to God, God talked back to them. And that elevated them in stature of men. This man can hear God's voice. In fact, it's even said about Moses that he talked to God as if he were his friend. Well, now we all get to do that. So the very thing that made these people set apart and heroes of the faith is is what Jesus is saying, hey, this is going to be the norm. So now everyone who follows Christ gets free access to God. And when you have free access to God, you can just, you can talk to God and God will have this conversational relationship with you where he speaks back to you. He says, my sheep know me and they know my voice. And so God wants to speak to us. And so this is the overarching conversation. And he's, he's dressing as a group and then specific individuals within the larger group. But the, the theme is consistently the same. Hey, everything's about to change. And so that's where we're going to pick up. We're going to pick up in Matthew Chapter 21, we'll begin reading in verse 33. So Jesus is still addressing the chief priests and the elders. So they're all there together, the chief priests, the priests, the Levites, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. So this is a large group of people. There are literally thousands of people in the courtyards in the temple, surrounding the temple with Jesus. And so there's this, there's this setting. He's told them a parable, and he's about to tell them another parable, and this is where we pick up. Verse 33, Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. And typically in the parables of Jesus, what we see is someone or something represents God, someone or something represents people, and and sometimes there's even multiple someones or some things that represent numerous groups of people. And so in this parable, the landowner represents God. So God is the one who plants the vineyard. Now, if you you want to look all the way through Old Testament scriptures, what you'll see is that that there there are allusions to the fact that God himself planted the people of Israel as his crop, as his people on the earth. And so here we have this analogy where Jesus is saying there's a landowner, and the landowner planted a a vineyard. He, He planted crops. And then what we see is, is in, in case they were kind of wondering, okay, now who's the crop? Okay, so the landowner's probably got who's, who are the crops? Then, then he goes through and he says, there are three different improvements. He dug a well, dug a wine press, built a watchtower. Well, those are three. I think I missed the three. The wall. Put a wall, not a well, a wall. It was huge. <laughs> biggest, biggest wall. 
So he built a wall around it, he dug the wine press, and he built a watchtower. Three improvements to the vineyard that was planted by, in this story, God. And so what we see is, is we parallel, right, the nation of Israel. He's trying to paint this picture. He's trying to make it very clear because the, the religious leaders, they have a history of not understanding what Jesus is talking about. They have a history of just missing it. And so he's trying to make it very clear. And so he's saying, he's saying the landowner, God, planted his crop, his vineyard, the people of Israel. He gave them three different improvements to this property. And what they would have heard is the three founding fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which are the, the three primary when they are the people. They say we, we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as our fathers. He gave them three improvements, three landowners, or three uh, founding father, so he's drawing all these parallels to the nation of Israel to make it clear that he is talking about the nation of Israel. So the landowner is God, the vineyard is God's people, the tenants are the Jewish leaders. He's saying that the tenants, when the servants of the landowner came, the servants of God came. They abused them. They mistreated them. They even killed some of them. Now, these, these people would not literally have, have been responsible for the deaths of any of the prophets. And yet the way that they handled their teaching as being the ones in charge of the temple abused, mistreated, and probably even killed some of the prophets' message. Because the message of the prophets was, there is coming a Messiah. And the way that they presented the message of the prophets was, y'all need us to tell you what to do, and by the way, keep giving us your money. And the way that they presented the message of the prophets, Jesus is here saying, the weight of that is on you for the way that you abused them, for the way that you mistreated them, even for the way that you just crushed their message. If you had been faithfully heralding the word of God to this point, you too would have been looking for the Messiah. You would have recognized him when he came, and, and you would have been pointing people faithfully to him, and yet they were not. Amen. So the whole point of the message of the prophets was being killed by the way it was being presented by the leaders of the temple. The servants, they represent those prophets, even up to and including John the Baptist, who had come to, uh, to earth, to the nation of Israel, proclaiming the word of the Lord in faithfulness, pointing people to God, trying to get people to, to return to God, some of them, some of them just faithfully pointing to the fact that God would send his salvation, the Messiah, into the world. The son in this story is Jesus. And in, in this last six days of Jesus' life, he is, I don't know if he's planting seeds of ideas or if he's just alluding to the fact of, I know the conversations that you're already having about me. But this is an interesting point. When he talks about the son, he, he says, they say, this is the heir. Let us throw him out and kill him. Because the vineyard is the people of God. He can't be in the vineyard of God. They don't even have the ability to take someone's life. It's not in their law. In order for them to kill him, they've got to get him out of the people of God into the Romans' hands because the Romans are the ones who kill people. And so, so they've been having these conversations. We've seen this in Scripture that they've been having the conversations, we want to kill Jesus. They've been plotting how to kill Jesus. At the end of this overarching conversation on six days in, they really ratchet it up and they say, okay, this guy's going to die. And we see that it only takes them less than a week to make it happen. And so Jesus is informing them right now through his analogy, hey, I know, I know the plans that you have, I know where you're going with this, and I understand you're going to have to bring in the Romans, you're going to have to get me outside of the vineyard in order to kill me because you don't have that authority in and of yourselves, but this is how it's all going to go down. And so the son is very clearly Jesus. As we continue walking through this, the other tenants, those should be us. Amen. And it's funny to me that the Pharisees are the ones who give this response. When Jesus says, what's he going to do? They say, well, he's going to take, he's going to bring those wretched to a wretched end. 
He's going to take the kingdom. He's going to give it to someone else. And those people are going to give him his rightful share of the harvest. We are the other people group. And according to this passage of scripture, it is on us to be ones who produce the fruit for the harvest. Amen. So again, we're kind of in this, in this section of scriptures, right, where we're preaching from the negative. And this is not my, my favorite way to preach. In fact, I don't even like to preach this way, but I do want to be faithful to, uh, to present the scriptures in the way that they're presented. So the scripture gives us all kinds of heroes of the faith where we can look at it and we can say, be like this guy, be like this girl, be like this group of people. Hey, they got it right. They crushed it. Look at their faith. Look at their inspiration. Look at their hope. Look at the miracles. And we have all kinds of scriptures about that. But then in faithfulness to us and to the realities of the world, the Bible also gives us these examples of, hey, don't be like that guy. And this is, this is not my favorite way to preach if I don't, don't do that. Right, But this is how it's presented. I mean, we have this, this interaction after interaction after interaction where Jesus himself is saying, hey, you guys missed it. Hey, you guys missed it. Hey, you guys missed it. And because all y'all missed it, here's what's going to happen. And he begins to change the course of the way that religion is done. So we're going to learn some things, again, uh, from, from the chief priests and the elders. What we're going to learn is, is things that, that they missed in an effort to teach us what we don't want to miss. If our goal is to be the ones that produce fruit, to be the people of God who give him the harvest, who are the fruit-producing people, then we don't want to miss the same things that they missed when Jesus removed the kingdom from them. This is macrocosm, right? Uh, we live in a, in a society, in a day and age, when um, churches are failing now, at a faster rate than ever in the history of mankind. And what I mean by failing is not just simply uh, not doing the will of God. What I mean is literally failing, closing their doors, going out of business. There are more church closures than have ever before. And, we, and, and it would be nice if we could just say, COVID. But that's not the case, Right? I mean, COVID has certainly hurt some churches, and, and there's no denying that, but, but COVID has also helped some churches. So we can't just blame it on that. Um, if, we, if we want to take this macrocosm of God saying, you missed it, and so I removed the kingdom from you, and I'm going to give it to someone who will do the will of God and will produce fruit, that we can take that macrocosm down to an individual church level of a microcosm and say there are churches that are failing because they missed the same things that the leaders of Israel missed. Instead of faithfully pointing people to Jesus, they started unfaithfully pointing them wherever they wanted them. Or maybe just not pointing them anywhere. Maybe it's like a choose-your-own-adventure book where it's like, I don't know, I loved those, but I never made the right choices. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to turn to page 86. And 86 would be like, boom, everything blew up and you died. I'd be like, to go back, take the other choice. But some churches have kind of taken this approach of, of just, we're, we're not going to take a hard stance on truth. We're not going to faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to allow all of the 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 things that people say out there that are just nonsensically crazy, we're going to invite those nonsensically crazy ideas and philosophies into the church. And instead of being a holy people set apart for God, what we're going to do is we're just going to let everything kind of influence us instead of us being the ones that influence everyone. And I think, it, I think that this would apply, that Jesus would say, hey, listen, you guys missed it, and so I'm removing the kingdom of God, and I'm going to give it to someone who will produce fruit. And so we as, as Christians, as Christ followers, we want to be the people who produce fruit. And so it's important for us to see the examples that Scripture gives us of, hey, this one was, was missed. And so here's what we learn about the religious leaders. The first thing from this passage is that the religious leaders didn't have the right heart. Jesus had been telling them this for a while. I, I often wonder, there's a lot of things that I just wonder, right? So like when Jesus was a child... And, and his parents lost him. 
They show up to Jerusalem. They have him. They leave Jerusalem. They don't have him. Three days later, yes, three days later, they realize we don't have him, so they go back to Jerusalem, and they find him sitting in the temple courts, and he's teaching the teachers. Now, I often wondered, what would the shape of Israel have been by the time that Jesus was bursting on the scene as the Messiah, revealing himself through signs and wonders as the Messiah, if his mom and dad had shown up and been like, you know what, this is probably where you belong. Let's give you the next 20 years to shape the hearts of men. What difference would that have made? But they didn't. They took him away. Right? Right? I wonder, I wonder if when Jesus was teaching and telling, like he, he was very forthcoming that they had the wrong heart. Like, like he tells them this on repeat. And I wonder what would have happened if they all would have repented. Like revival broke out in the Sanhedrin, Pharisees getting saved, Sadducees, you know, speaking in tongues. Like what would have happened if, if revival had come to the religious leaders? We don't know. But you can flip back to Matthew chapter 15 when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And in verse 7 he says, You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Now they, they would have known this prophecy. They would have had this in their skill set, right? They could have talked all about this. Never in their lives would they have applied this to themselves. Never in their lives when they were teaching through Isaiah would they have said, and then, you know, here comes the part about us right here. This is our part. They never would have applied that to themselves, but Jesus does. And this isn't one of those veiled parables. This is him very plainly saying, your heart is far from me. You worship me in vain. Your lips can proclaim the truth, but your heart is not where your heart should be. And then here we are again, if you fast forward back to Matthew chapter 21, this is what we see again. An example of this in Matthew 15, which is an example of Isaiah actually living itself out in their modern day. He sets the scene by telling them a parable, and then he asks them the question, which is the Jewish way of teaching. He says, what, what's going to happen? And this is their response in verse 41. He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. This was their answer. This wasn't Jesus' answer. This was their answer. Like they understood the things to say. They answered the question correctly. They probably even were smiling like, hey, I got this one. Watch this, boys. Like they, they knew the things to say, which is what Isaiah was prophesying about them. They, they worship me with their lips. They have a knowledge. Their knowledge tells them the things to say, and because they know the things to say, they can say what's right, what sounds good. It sounds like they're saying things that make sense, but their heart, their heart isn't where it should be, which was Jesus' response. I... Uh, I think of verse 43 when Jesus says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Where Jesus takes their words and tries to shed some light on them. So they say, he's going to bring those wretches to a wretched end. He's going to take that vineyard. He's going to rent it to someone else. And Jesus says, yep. So the kingdom of God is being removed from you and it's going to be given to someone else, just like you said. He's casting light on their heart. There's no parable. It's about as plain as it gets, right? Jesus says, you. The kingdom of God will be taken from you. There's no, there's no speaking in code here. He's just being very plain. Religion is about to change. Access to God is about to change. We're about to remove everything from you in your way, and we're about to give it to a people outside of Israel to, where anyone from any tribe, from any tongue, can come to know God, and salvation will be for all, and everyone will have free access to God. We are that people. 
How does it look to produce fruit? How does it look to, to reap the harvest that Christ wants us to reap? I want us to, to flip to Galatians chapter 6. We're going to read verses 9 and 10. It says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, that's all, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, I want us to notice all the different farming analogies, right? We, we've, got, we've got planting, we've got bearing fruit, we've got harvest time, we've got reaping. This is consistent with a spiritual law uh, that we see in Scripture that is sowing and reaping. So in our Bible, we, we talk about sowing and reaping. Sowing is the act of planting seed. Reaping is the act of harvesting the seed. And, and, and this, is, this is the spiritual law that is in Scripture. In fact, if we were to back up to verse 7 in Galatians chapter 6, it even says a man reaps what he sows. And so we see this in Scripture, and this is actually something that every world religion agrees on. We use the terminology of sowing and reaping. But other world religions would use words like karma. We have phrases like, you get out of it what you put into it. Like this is, this is the one commonality of every world religion that what you invest, you will return. In terms of the farming analogies that we see in Scripture, if we plant wheat, we harvest wheat. If we plant corn, we harvest corn and make it hard to see as you're exiting the church. <laughs> Whatever we plant, that's what we're going to harvest. This is just it should be logical, and yet the scriptures have to tell us this on repeat because our hearts just get far away from God sometimes, and we just expect everything to go the way we want when we're not investing anything in the way that it should be. If what we sow is good, what we reap will be good. 1 Corinthians uh, tells us that if we sow sparingly, we'll reap sparingly. If we, if we sow generously, we'll reap generously. This is a consistent theme throughout all of Scripture, that what you sow, you will reap. And what Galatians is telling us is that if we do not grow weary in doing good, at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. If, if, we, we, if what we're planting is good, then the harvest that we reap is going to be good. But here's the thing about that. God gets to be the one who defines what good looks like for you. So a lot of times we'll be like, but God, I'm doing everything right. I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying in the morning time. My journal's looking full. I've been going to church. I didn't cuss at the lady at Brahms when she made me mad. Like, everything's going right. Why is my neighbor still a jack wagon? And we expect, because we're, we're doing the, the sowing, we expect everything to go the way that we want it to, but, but God is the one that defines good. And it may be that the good that God wants from you is the way you respond in a godly Christian manner to your jack wagon neighbor is the good. It may be that what you're experiencing, the level of encouragement that that allows God to give you is the good. That his presence to, to help you endure your circumstances, that's the good. It's not just the absence of bad, it's that God helps you in the bad and that he can walk beside you faithfully in the bad. Amen. And that through the bad, we come to know him in new ways. Amen. And God says, this is good. And this is happening because you're doing good. You're, you're faithfully sowing good so you get to reap good. Now, that doesn't mean the absence of everything bad. It just means that God's going to be faithful and walk with you and reveal himself to you and that God is going to do what only God can do because it's him being the one that rewards. See, they didn't have the right heart. They weren't looking to do good. They were looking to maintain their position. They weren't looking to do good. They, they were looking to, to just... Keep status quo. They didn't like that Jesus was rocking the boat. They liked it less when he calmed the winds and the waves so the boat would stop rocking. They had the wrong heart. How do we reap a harvest that God wants us to reap? Galatians 6 tells us that we do the good that he puts in front of us to do. 
When we continually do good, it says, let us look to do good to all, but especially to the people that are part of his body. When we, when we look to do the good that he puts in front of us to do, then what happens is God's able to reap a harvest from the fruit that we're sowing. Our goal is just to faithfully do the good that he puts in front of us to do. And to not grow weary in that. Because that can be a tiresome thing. We don't grow weary in doing good. If we endure, we reap the harvest. Here's the second thing we learn about the religious leaders. The religious leaders didn't have the right focus. They didn't have the right heart, and they didn't have the right focus. Matthew 21, verses 45 and 46 says, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. That's the second time in a 20-verse span that we see that they're afraid of the people. Their focus was on the people around them. Their focus was on their image. Their focus was on not the things of God, but the things of man. Their focus was on their own comfort level, their own um, standard of living, the influence that they had. Their their, Their focus was on the people. Their focus was not on God. Their focus was wrong. They had the wrong heart and they had the wrong focus. The fact that they were more afraid of what the crowd might do to them than they were about missing the kingdom of God tells us that they were more focused on the here and now than they were on eternity. And this is contrary to what Paul tells us in the book of Colossians. If if we flip over there to chapter 3, the first two verses, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Having the right focus, having the right focus will allow us to push through the difficulties of doing the good that God puts in front of us to do. This is why they they didn't want to do that. This is why when Jesus came and started trying to change things, they started opposing that and pushing back against that because they didn't have the right focus, which, which led them to not having the right heart. When we have the right focus, God is above, God is in control, the Holy Spirit is leading me, this is what Christ has put in front of me to do, then it doesn't matter when there's opposition to the good that we do or when there's misunderstanding about the good that we do, it gives us the endurance and the strength and the hope to just do the good that he puts in front of us to do. This is the the piece of of the puzzle that allows us to see God in the places where it's difficult to see God. When when life is difficult, when, when circumstances change, when something seems unfavorable to us, our minds usually aren't trained to see God in that. In fact, our, our first assumption is the enemy is opposing me. When it may not be. I mean, it may be, but it may not be. Sometimes what God's doing is he's simply just allowing things to happen that are going to push us towards him, draw us into him. And we need to train our our minds, we need to set our minds on the things above so that when difficulty happens, when hardship comes, when life doesn't go the way that we want it to go, we see Jesus in the midst of that and it draws us into him. To a deeper relationship with him, to a deeper knowledge of him, to a deeper understanding of him, these things, they draw us into Jesus. And, And listen, Is it the enemy attacking you? Maybe. But even if it is, Jesus is able to use that for for what? Good. The, The whole Bible ties together this way. That the way that we produce the fruit that God wants us to in the kingdom of God is by doing the good that he puts in front of us to do. And then there's the harvest that comes from that. And even in that harvest, if it's not the way that we thought it would be, it's still good because he's working all things together for good. He's taking what the enemy meant for destruction and working it to good. And even in the hardships, we can see his fingerprints all over it. 
He doesn't leave us alone. He's not the kind of God that just says, go get him, tiger, and then steps back away from everything. He's the kind of God that says, come on, let's do this thing together. So in order for us to do the good that he puts in front of us to do, we've got to maintain the right heart. We're for the the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God above everything else, even if it means difficulties for me, I'm still for the kingdom of God. If what he's asking me to do will advance the kingdom of God, but it's uncomfortable for me, I'm still going to be faithful to do it. If I don't like talking to people, but he's telling me to go talk to someone, I better go talk to someone because I'm going to do the good he's put in front of me to do. And then, we, and then we maintain the right focus, which is my, my mind is set, my heart is set on things above, not on temporal things. So, so if someone's pushing back against me, if it makes me look a certain way, if I get a certain reputation, that's fine. Because eternity is a long time. And this present earth is not very long by comparison. I need to have the right heart. I need to have the right focus. And when I do, I will faithfully do the good that God puts in front of me to do. And when I'm faithfully doing the good, I will reap a harvest if I do not give up. And that harvest is advancing the kingdom of God. I'd like to ask you guys to stand with me. I'm going to close the service in prayer. And, uh, and I'm going to pray for all of us, so I, I encourage you to uh, be a participator in prayer, so I want you to pray right along with me as I pray, and uh, prayer is just simply talking to God, but ask God to help you to do the things that we've been talking about doing. Father, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness to us. God, I ask your help, I ask your grace. You know, there are times when, when we get discouraged, there are times when we get down, there are times when our heart is not where it should be and our focus is not where it should be, but God, you're good. And you have the grace that comes in and lovingly just points us back in the right direction. You reestablish our steps, God, so that we can see the things that you want us to see and have the heart that you want us to heart to have. God, I pray that your grace would surround us. I pray, God, in the midst of hardship especially, that, that you would help us to see you in that. And that that would draw us into your presence even more. God, we praise you and we thank you for the examples of Scripture that you give us to where we can say we don't want to do this so instead we're going to do this god i ask you to help us give us strength encouragement and hope in jesus name amen amen church we love you guys praying for you be dismissed <laughs>